All right, hello and welcome. Uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Tawil. I'm the Director of Film Programming at the Arab Film and Media Institute. And today I have the honor of speaking with Hani Abu Assad, a Palestinian filmmaker with a prolific career that I know many of our audience is very familiar with, um, but has a brand new film opening in American theaters called Huda Salon. Uh, it will be in theaters and online on March 4th, and is the reason we've been brought together to talk today. Thank you so much for taking some time to chat with me today, Hani. Thank you, Yasmin, and um, pleasure to meet you uh, uh, through, uh, through uh, Zoom. Yeah, <laughs> hopefully someday soon it will not be on Zoom, but hopefully. you know. <laughs> Um, so just to jump into it, uh, could you start by telling us a little bit about the film, what it's about? Um, like 20 years ago, I read an article about a saloon, hair salon in Palestine that been used or misused by the secret service, the Israeli secret service to recruit girls in order to let them spy, become a spy uh, on their uh, you know, family, neighbors, environment. And they did that by, uh, uh, by filming them naked after they drug them and, uh, and then uh, you know, blackmail them. Mm -hmm. So in our society, some of, uh, let's say, some of uh, uh, some of uh, some of our men, not all of them, uh, they would uh, they won't support the woman in this case. Mm -hmm. So mostly, women will be uh, an easy uh, uh, easy uh, prey uh, for uh, she will be an easy victim for blackmail. Mm -hmm. So I realized I want to do a story about this uh, one day. And uh, two years ago, my wife asked me if I knew a strong story about Palestinian women, that they, are, they live in a difficult circumstances. And I told her about this article. And she said, it's not, a, it's not yet a story. What's the story you think? Mm -hmm. And we slept about it. Next day, I wrote the outline of Huda Salon. And then she said, it's, it's actually your story because it's, it's, it become a thriller. Mm -hmm. And always I try to make stories in the thriller genre. And mm -hmm. I believe because um, thriller ca can intensify the experience in a way that you can let the audience think about complex issue in a, simple way. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less the history of the of the film. And it's about yes, it's about uh, a, a, a vulnerable woman that being blackmailed and uh, being put into the uh, situation where she has to make a choice between betraying her country or betraying herself. Yeah, this uh, sort of theme of the complicated nature of resisting um, and specifically occupation is something I've seen a lot in your films. The, you know, the, the stress between um, resisting and uh, being able to gain benefits from Israel and between, uh, you know, a personal life and a political life. Uh, I, I see that a lot in, in your films. Surprisingly though, I see a lot of um, outlets sort of saying that, I don't know, uh, they, they call it, they say it's not an issue film, though I, I find it very intertwined with the politics of everything that's going on, but from such a, a personal point of view. Um, I'm saying this without really much of a question at the end of it, just an observation um, about uh, such an interesting way that you that you intertwine folks' personal lives with the political situation um, that is going on and, the, and how complicated and, and nuanced it can be. 
Um, and yes. I find, yeah, and I find this a very interesting, different take. Um, you know, I, I had no idea about this, this particular story and some of these particular struggles that Palestinian women went through. Um, yeah, listen, I, um, let's say, I've, as a filmmaker, I've, because I'm not a preacher or politician, mm-hmm. I don't need to, uh, condam- to make a movie in order to condemn the occupation because the occupation is condemned with or without my movement. It's like, it's mm-hmm. by, by definition, occupation is condemned. Yeah. It should, should end and it will end. I believe it will end. There is no way this situation will continue forever. It doesn't exist, especially with Palestinians. They prove that they are so resilient that whatever they try, they are not succeeding. Mm-hmm. The let's say to uh, to uh, eliminate us from the, from the from the land. So, as a filmmaker, your job is to make people. Uh, think that it's not an issue while actually it's an issue mm-hmm. this is the power of the movie i think and not just me any any good movie is when when it it it's a it's a it feels like it's an, not an issue because most people don't want to go, they want to be entertained mm-hmm. you're watching movie but they go out with an issue and this is what I try to do in the movie. You know, that it's it's on the one side, it's entertaining. On the other mm-hmm. side, it's exploring complex themes in an accessible way. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think it, it it is really, it achieves exactly uh, what you said. And I think it also explores themes that go beyond Palestine. Um, I have read uh, you talk about the themes of loyalty um, that come up in the film. Um, could you uh, talk about that a little bit? Yes, I think one of our most important uh, experience in life when we experience betrayed, and I think nobody on earth did not experience that, you know, betray small betray big betray it's the same it's like when you trust somebody and then you feel betrayed so it's an universal timeless issue mm-hmm. so you uh, 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 stories in the bible they are writing <laughs> it's about <laughs> you know there is the betrayal of uh, of, of yusuf from his brothers let's say mm-hmm. But also like Hamlet is about, you know, uh, it's it's an universal theme. So what you do is you take an universal theme and you put it in a specific uh, situation in, in, in a place called Palestine. Mm-hmm. So the texture is very uh, authentic and Palestinian, but the theme is very universal. Mm-hmm. And why betrayal always come back in my stories because after I did Huda Salon, my wife said to me, you realized you are you do you realize that all your movies is about betrayal? Wow, 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 how? Yeah, now Paradise Now it's about betrayal and blackmail. Mm-hmm. Omar is about betrayal and blackmail. Huda Salon is about betrayal and blackmail. Mm-hmm. Why you have why the theme is coming back into your uh, uh, stories and films. And I realized I have to think, like, well, what's the problem? What's the problem here? Why, they, yeah, indeed, why they are coming back? And I realized that there was two stories in my life when I was young that almost shaped who I am. Mm-hmm. And it's about betrayal. One that I was betrayed by a good friend and I was almost put in danger mm-hmm. and left in danger and uh, and it was, a, uh, you know, he betrayed me in a way that could endanger my life. Mm-hmm. And after that, like almost half year, I was in a huge depression because I loved that. I loved him so much and 
I felt like he's my idol and, and, and then to be betrayed by somebody you love so much. It was a, and the first time in life, because later, you know, you, you betrayal become like uh, changing, changing socks. Like, oh yeah, when somebody <laughs> betrayed me, like, oh, okay, okay. It's part of life. Yeah. But when the first time it's really, it hits you hard and probably it's a big trauma. And the second trauma was when I was younger a little bit, I was 11. And I, I betrayed a friend. I accused him of doing something he did not do. I falsely accused him. And he was punished by the teacher and by the school. And I felt so guilty. And actually, I feel guilty till now. When I saw him like a while ago, almost, and he did not recognize me, almost I wanted to apologize, but I did not do because, because I felt like maybe he doesn't remember. Mm -hmm. But still, we were 11, and now I'm 60, and still I struggle with that event that I accuse him falsely of doing something that he did not do. Mm. And I felt later so so guilty about it. Mm -hmm. So your films have been a space for you to explore these feelings from these, these events. Yeah, <laughs> without I'm, even I'm realizing I'm it. trying to redeem myself. <laughs> Um, I also really wanted to talk about the uh, the style of the film and the process you used to make it because um, I was reading a little about that and found it very, very interesting um, that it's all uh, one takes. Am I right? Every every scene is is one shot. Yeah. And um, cinematically means that you are, the audience are stuck with the character in the time and place. Mm -hmm. And because the situation is, is intense, so even the dead time, we call it in drama, dead time, for example, mm -hmm. wait, it's dead time. Yeah. It will be ex experienced as double because you mm -hmm. feel you are like in that situation, sitting there, waiting for the doctor, for example, at the waiting room, hearing these thoughts and stories and still feels intense because it's you are stuck there with the character sitting yeah. there waiting. So this was the concept of making the audience uh, being uh, stuck in time and place. Mm -hmm. This is why I shot all the scenes in one shot. But also I explored inside that concept, the concept of contradiction between subjective point of view and objective point of view. Mm -hmm. So because the movie is about contradiction between betrayal and loyalty, between like, you know, uh, enemy and friendship, all these mm -hmm. things. Also, cinematically, I want to explore the contradiction between the subjective and objective point of view. So in that sense, when you shoot one scene in one shot, every scene in one shot, it's an objective point of view, but you try inside that concept to make it subjective, where you become the mirror of the character. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's like, you know, you as a filmmaker, always you try to challenge yourself. Otherwise, it's going to become very boring. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you can definitely feel that this the whole film is so tense and um, feels like it takes a million years in, in a good sense. I'm not saying it as in it's boring, but you can feel that tension building and uh, it's uncomfortable as it is for the characters as well. I also um, liked this duality uh, between Reem and, and Huda and kind of the reflections of each other um, in the film. I found that very interesting. Um, and also just, and, and Huda sort of uh, continuing a cycle that she was once, um, she was once in Reem's shoes and now she is subjecting others um, to that. I keep saying things without a question at the end. I'm so sorry, <laughs> just observations. I, <laughs> I just worry. like having a discussion with you about this. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, I I also uh, saw you mention somewhere that uh, that not that Reem and Huda reflecting each other is very purposeful, as well as the physical positions you put them in above and below, correct? 
Yes. So the same, it's contradiction in above and under, mm -hmm. also in flashback and flash forward. Mm -hmm. So I want to make, uh, I did, I, if, if you take the experience of one character, meaning that you have to go flashback. Mm -hmm. Yes, you start with Huda and then you see her in, in her past that she was once a victim. Now mm -hmm. she's a perpetuator. But in that concept of, of uh, one, uh, in, in stuck in time and place, there is no place for flashback. So yeah. I said, if I do two characters where the one is actually reflecting the other as if it's its own flashback or flash forward, mm -hmm. how this will work with also the concept of under the ground and above the ground and how you mm -hmm. can connect them, you know, like by cinematic, uh, 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 transmission of the pick of the Polaroid, you know, mm -hmm. the Polaroid going from da to up where uh, it navigates as a ticking bomb. Also, okay. it navigates as also the picture is navigating as the child that Reem is trying to protect. You know, up all the time, Reem is, is hiding her child mm -hmm. here. And then also, Huda hide the picture inside her, you know, inside her, yeah. as if protecting the child in, in, in her, in, you know. So all these kind of metaphors and, you know, concepts are all complex issues, but working as, a, as the clock, as all the, you know, mm -hmm. all the wheels inside the clock. Yeah. They are all like, it's very complicated and they are like, you know, but they are all working in the same direction of like boom, boom, very simple, like boom, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. But in itself, they are very com complex. And this is yeah. what, what I try to do. Yeah. How do you go about putting all of those, all those clock gears, so to speak, together? And, and do you have like a process that you build up all of these details and all of these metaphors, or does it kind of just come out this way? No, it's an experience too, and sometimes come up with uh, unconsciously. Mm -hmm. But at the end, you don't believe really in, like all the time your mind is, is working. Yes, it's mm -hmm. process. So even when you are resting, and the best way of become creative is to rest a lot. You know, not to do anything, just to, to look and to media, uh, to, uh, um, um, you know, to, you know, just to relax and to listen to music, you know, to uh, meditate, medi meditate. Mm -hmm. Because then you will allow your unconscious to process all the information you have. So all these things I read once about it, I study it, I, but they have to, in my mind, make their own way to come up with the new ideas. Mm -hmm. Yes. So it comes sometimes unconsciously like there, but in fact, they are being, it's a process. It's a natural process of, of an artist creating uh, by observing its own environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard that before that you can't create art, you can't write unless you are also living um, and experiencing the world around you. Um, that is a good reminder for all of us to rest uh, yeah, because it's, to it's easy guilty. to forget. Mm -hmm. And not to feel guilty because uh, our time, our society now, our system mm -hmm. is, is it truly makes you feel guilty if you do nothing. Yeah. Because you think the world is like in a marathon. And if you sit and you think, oh my God, the world is moving and I'm not moving, and you are anxious all the time. But a true artist will allow himself to do nothing and not to feel guilty about it because the nothing is crucial for creation. Mm -hmm. I love that. And that's um, definitely a, a fantastic piece of advice to pass down to our younger up and coming 
filmmakers, aspiring filmmakers, um, you know, at the end of this, I was going to ask for your advice, and there, there it is. Um, since we're always trying to uh, engage the next, the next uh, generation of filmmakers, so good reminder to all of those watching to rest. Yeah, and and believe me, I I I, I was taught also by an older generation. So this I. Uh, once I met a writer that was accomplished, and um, I was a beginner, and he uh, and he told me like uh, sometimes he's like, you know, he's like two weeks just lying on the couch and reading and reading nothing important, like not like reading just you know pulp or, <laughs> <laughs> and and the moment and he said the moment you don't feel guilty about it, it's the true moment that you are an artist. Mm -hmm. I so I, when I realized that I, uh, I uh, gave myself the luxury mm -hmm. to not do uh, for a long time. Sometimes I do nothing, and then yeah. comes ideas. Comes like you, you don't, you have no idea how they just come and the pow. Yeah. Well, and your entire filmography, your entire career is clearly testament that to that working. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, so we're running out of time. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you so much um, for taking the time to, to speak with me today. Uh, I hope that we can meet in person sometime soon. To everyone watching, make sure to go see Huda Salon in theaters around the country on March 4th, as well as online if you can't make it to the theater. All right. Bye, honey. Bye-bye.